Hello, humanity. And thank you for watching the Peer to Peer Unconditional Income YouTube channel. My name is Zachary Weaver, and I'm crowdsourcing a peer to peer unconditional income of $7,000 a month and writing a documentary about it. I am also the founder of the Creative Wealth Community, a free mastermind incubator for people identifying and pursuing their own definition of wealth, and the co founder of One Trust, which is focused on sparking and advancing the peer to peer unconditional income movement through coaching and telling the stories of people on the leading edge of this idea. With me is my co-founder at OneTrust, Sothvik Vossum. In addition to being our director of coaching, Sothvik is also the, for the founder of Go All In Agency, a business coaching agency which prioritizes achieving results by going within first and foremost. His professional expertise is in the fields of renewable energy, product development, and entrepreneurship education. And he is and he currently works with founders, executives, and artists to help them align their values to hit their most ambitious and exciting goals. Today, we have the immense pleasure of interviewing Carl Weiderquist. Carl is a professor of philosophy at Georgetown University, Qatar, with a background as an economist. He specializes in distributive justice, the ethics of who has what. He writes on many topics, including social contract theory, freedom, equality, property rights, and sufficientarianism but he's best known for his work on basic income. He's published dozens of articles in fields as diverse as economics, philosophy, politics, and anthropology. He's published 10 books, including Freedom as the Power to Say No, Prehistoric Myths and Modern Political Philosophy, A Critical Discussion of Basic Income Experiments, and The Prehistory of Private Property. He co-founded the U.S. Basic Income Guarantee Network in 1999, and the academic journal Basic Income Studies in 2006. He's appeared on or been quoted by many media outlets, including the New York Times, NBC News, and the Atlantic Monthly, which called him a leader of the worldwide basic income movement. His current project is due out in January of 2024, and it's a book entitled Universal Basic Income for MIT Press's Essential Knowledge Series. Welcome, Carl. Thank you. My pleasure. So one of the aspects that just thrills me about your work is that you are developing uh, what you call an independentarian political theory that you call justice as the pursuit of a court or JPA. I think you have brilliantly identified something that's fairly obvious uh, when one thinks about it, which is uh, this partial quote from your website that all unequal societies in history have been biased in favor of politically and economically powerful insiders and against both socioeconomic and political outsiders. And rather than trying to develop a comprehensive social contract that no reasonable person could object to, your theory seeks to pursue accord and at the same time asks as little as possible from political outsiders and disadvantaged people. Now, I've never heard of anything exactly like this, and yet I feel like this is exactly what I've been looking for. So could you just share some of your favorite things to talk about when it comes to independentarianism? Great, great. That's the kind of question I like. Um, yeah, the the uh, um, the hardest thing for a society to do is to avoid pressing its outsiders, its least advantaged people, um, and yet I find most of the major political theories imagining that they can solve that pretty easily and they usually solve it with uh with a fairy tale um the 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 prevailing ones um are natural rights theories where you have uh we're going to list some natural rights um rights rights can be very good things uh but it depends what the list of natural rights are, and they often list list uh, list uh, come up with a list of rights that are very favorable to insiders. Like mm -hmm. we have a right to private property, except for that's really unequal, and a lot of us don't have any property at all, and some of us own uh, all the resources of the earth and and uh, everything we've made out of it, and the others just have to come to those those who have not have to go to those who have. Uh, in order to work for them, and this is this idea of uh, in order to work for them, or they don't have the right to to survive on this planet, um, and this is supposed to embody freedom. That is not freedom. That is that is effectively for servitude. Then we have this other 
main one, which is social contract theory, where um, we imagine everybody coming together. What could be better than this? Everybody coming together um, to sign a contract and say, well, what contract would we sign if everybody came together and signed it? Uh, what kind of society and what kind of rules would we build? Um, but then, uh, and that sounds really good, but then they imagine, well, they say, I think we'd sign this kind of contract. And then I'm going to assume that every rational or reasonable person would sign this contract. And those who don't, we're going to just going to kind of dismiss them as being, their complaints are just, they're just kind of being unreasonable. Um, they're being unreasonable. So we're going to kind of assume that their better selves, their more reasonable self is actually on board with this. And for some people, I'm for, for murderers, for murderers and things like that. I, you know, I suppose that's true. But when you think about the poor and the press and the weak, um, that's really not true. It's really it, it, it giving ourselves an excuse to uh, ignore the complaints of the few, um, uh, the complaints of the few, not of the, of, of the, of the, of the biggest outsiders. And even I would say, one of the, the best of these social contract theories, kind of most of these social contract theories will compare society to some imagined so-called state of nature where everything's terrible. And then you say, look, society, not everything is completely terrible. Um, so you're better off. So you would naturally sign the contract that makes it better off. Well, actually, actually, uh, when we don't have these rules, it's not necessarily true that everybody's worse off. If you actually look at anthropology, societies that don't have a social contract of this kind. So this guy, John Rawls, in the mid to late 20th century, comes along and says, no, you don't just compare it to the worst scenario. What we need is a social contract that compares it all the different possible social contracts we have, and you take one that is the maximum advantage to the least advantaged individual. Mm -hmm. That's John Rawls, Rawlsianism. What could possibly be more in what could be more good for outsiders than John Rawls's idea of the maximum advantage for the least advantaged member of society? It sounds wonderful, but what he does is he bakes in one little assumption that is really very favorable to the people in power, which is what is society? Society is is um it's is an, uh, uh, it's an association of people who get together for mutual advantage to which we all contribute, um, to which we all contribute and we all take advantage. And because we all contribute, then that is why we are entitled in Rawls, because we all are either we do contribute or we're willing to if we're disabled. Um, because we are willing to contribute, uh, we are entitled to be to be considered the least advantage. But what about those people who don't want to contribute? What about the people who say, uh, so that means you've got to you've got to take a job. If if jobs are available in Rawls's thing and you're capable of doing them, you have to take those jobs. Hmm. Which means you're taking that least advantaged person and saying you must take this job, which is the same thing that the libertarian natural property rights people say you've got to take this job it puts people at a huge disadvantage it asks a lot from them to begin with to prove that they are part of the society that they are a contributor so i do not begin with the assumption that society is some mutually advantageous association that i i i go with rodney king's theory of what society is he most famously said, can't we all get along after the riots, um, after the film of him being beaten in, what was it, 93, the early 90s. Um, mm -hmm. But before he said that, he said, we are all stuck here together for a while. That's what society is. It's a bunch of people who are stuck together. And some people make rules. And they will make rules and and... It would be great if we all got together and we all signed a contract and we all made a contract that was really in the advantage of everyone. But that's not what really has happened or really can ever happen. Um, tends to be that more powerful people make the rules, no matter how much you try to be democratic. 
even if you get a perfect democracy, it might be the most privileged 51% people making the rules. Um, so the rules are going to tend to favor insiders. And then the insider is going to tell himself a bunch of reasons why, oh, because of the natural rights of these private property owners, they basically own all the resources of the earth and these disadvantaged people have to go work for them, tough luck for them. Um, or if you're a Rawlsian, like, well, yeah, we're, we're really going to help those poor people. But first, we're going to make them work because you've got to contribute. Um, so what I'm saying is, is that we've already imposed things on the disadvantaged. We've already imposed a whole set of rules that advantage rich people, rich people, that advantage political insiders, and that we've got to take the people who have least, the, the disabled, the, the the disabled, the culturally disenfranchised, the people, the, the 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 weak, the poor, all these people, and say, we're going to ask as little as we can from you, um, and then we will give you offers to, con to contribute and help and try, and but we'll try to discipline ourselves so that we're going to make sure you can live your lives. If 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 since we've imposed all these rules on you that have that have disadvantaged you, and we don't know how to get all the disadvantages out of the system, we're going to say you don't have to do anything if you don't want to. And then we will offer you opportunities, but we will discipline ourselves by saying, by saying. We're not going to make you contribute. We're not going to starve you to death if you don't contribute the way our current systems our current systems do. We're not going to make you live under a bridge if you don't contribute. We're not going to make you p put up a tent and eat out of someone else's uh, dumpster. But we're going to uh, someone eat someone else's garbage to survive. We're going to make sure you start with a decent living, and then we're going to ask con to contribute so you can so you have this power to say no to what we're trying to get you to do. And that will force the more privileged people to give you a better deal. Hmm. That's amazing, Carl. Um, I, I've decided that I want to start identifying as an independentarian. And I hesitate to ever adopt yeah. any labels like this yeah. because <laughs> there's usually something that I disagree mm -hmm. with in the philosophy. And I, I don't want to identify as something that I yeah. can't purely defend. Mm -hmm. um, but with yours, I, I, I feel in total agreement. Uh, so do you do you have any thoughts about people starting to call themselves independentarians? Yeah, I, I, there are a few people who do. Now, okay, so, something sure. that I believe your podcast listeners won't understand. Actually, um, I it's kind of my job to come up with things like this, like uh, mm -hmm. to, to come uh, like how many people, do you know, who invented isms? Well, actually, I know like a half a dozen people who've invented isms. Um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 Philippe Van Parijs, who invented what he calls real libertarianism. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know him. Uh, Ingrid Robbins, limitarianism, where you want a maximum. She focuses on the need to have a maximum amount of wealth, so there's or, or a maximum level of inequality, um, and, uh, and that's limitarianism. And I briefly met Amitai Etzioni, who created communitarianism. Um, and political philosophers, you can further the existing political theories, or you can come up with your own. Um, and I came up with my own political theory. It's out. It's outlined in several of my books. Um, so if you read enough of my books, you'll probably find something you'll disagree with. But it's, you know, it's a framework. It's a framework for these things. So, um, but a lot of political philosophers do come up with their own political theory. And, uh, and you got to call it something. So uh, since it stresses independence, I call I call it independentarianism, but I but the theory the general theory is uh, the general theory that's behind it. I call justice is the pursuit of accord, which is because it admits that there are insoluble problems in trying to create a system. Social contract theory says if you imagine this big social contract. It will solve all our problems. Uh, we will solve all the injustices if you follow what it takes to create a social contract. Now, there's a few things for the legislative phase, but we'll have a framework that is truly just. Uh, and uh, or, or natural rights theorists will say, as long as you identify the correct list of rights and you will you make sure everybody gets those rights, there will be no injustice. I'm saying we're groping at trying to create rules. It's just me and you, and we don't know what we're doing. So what we got to try to do is instead of imagining a social contract that we all would have signed in the past and saying, well, if you object to that, you're just unreasonable, is that we all have different ideas of what kind of social contract we should have. 
So we have to try to come together in a genuine accord, not saying you assign this. In, you would have signed this in the past, so we're going to hold you to it now. But we are always and continually trying to get everybody on board, everybody into accord, not that they just signed it in the past, but they feel that it is working for them now. And we admit that we, we can't just assume everybody does this and the ones who don't are unreasonable. So we always have to be pursuing it. We're always pursuing accord. Amazing. I, I, I really, I love it. And um, Sothic, I feel like maybe this would be a good time for yeah. you know, some of your questions. Yeah, I, um, you know, it's really curious to, uh, like, this is something that I'm always curious about, you know, working as a coach is uh, what kind of background, you know, like, what was your childhood like, Carl, that enabled you to create isms, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, well, I actually, um, I come, came from, I was, I was born in Chicago, Mm. Um, but I grew up in a small town in Michigan. It was a rather unique small town. It, it was it was a major, it, it was in Michigan. And I think people think of the Underground Railroad like stopping at the, uh, at the edge of the slave states, and that's not how it worked. The Underground Railroad extended all the way up to the northern U.S. and into Canada, and Cassopolis was a major hub for all of the slaves, uh, all of the, the, the escaped former enslaved people, Coming up through Illinois and Indiana, they would they the two lines would meet in Cassopolis, and then they go east across the state, uh, and from Detroit into into uh, into Ontario, which uh, which of course after the 1830s um, had no uh, after about what was 1835 I think when Britain Britain now was but anyway in this period so about 30 years before the end of slavery. Um, it was a major hub on the Underground Railroad. Um, and some some of the former enslaved people decided to settle there. Um, so it's been an integrated community since about the 1830s or 1840s. Mm. Uh, and my parents moved there intentionally, being liberal Christians who believed that the, the message of of uh, the message of uh, uh, the message of of the Bible is not, which which uh, person who does something that I don't do, am I going to hate this week? Uh, uh, that's not what Christianity is about. It's about helping the weak and the poor is the way they saw it. So I was raised by people who are very concerned about morality um, and uh, and but concerned con concerned that I, and, and I was naively as a kid growing up in the 70s after the civil rights movement, like, well, we solved this racism thing. You know, what's next? When, mm. And I and. Uh, and okay, well, I realized realize that we hadn't solved the racism thing, but I thought that our treatment of the poor was the was the biggest failing of our country after all the progress we'd made on racism, which was one of the same things that that Martin Luther King said before he was uh, in the last year of his life. Um, uh, he's famous for saying we need to explore the guaranteed income. He also said it's easier to integrate a bus than it is to guarantee an income for everyone. Uh, so, uh, so this idea that economic injustice was the big injustice, uh, that this is something I need, to, I need to look at. Now I think, well, American military, American militarism, um, uh, the, the growth of nationalism and fascism around the world, we're killing the environment that sustains us. All of these problems are just as big as, as the, our treatment of the weak and the poor. Um, but this is this is the one I'm specializing in. So I decided to specialize that from a, a young age. I majored in economics and got a PhD in economics because I figured to know how to build a just society, you had to know how the economy worked, which is true, but that's not what economists do. Economists don't, although economists do write on these things, they don't really make their career on this. They make their career about uh, yeah, yeah, theory of interest rates or something like that. Um, so, so, um, so, uh, so um, after working as an economist for a few years, I said, well, how do I really make social justice my career? And I eventually came to the conclusion I had to go back to graduate school, get a second PhD, become a career changer, get a second PhD uh, in, in normative political theory, and really start doing this full time. And, and it's proved to be an advantage. It's, it's proved to be an advantage to have that background in economics so I can... I can 
I can write more confidently about how the economy works than a lot of my colleagues can. Wow. What a, what a service to society that, you know, that you've been able to do with not only all the books and, um, you know, your involvement in the basic income movement and, um, and of course your, your students, could you talk about like, you know, how you're, you know, what kind of courses you teach now and like, like, what, like, who are the kind of people that you work with, um, students, faculty, uh, you're a jet setting guy as well. You know, you, you have, uh, you know, you have a campus in, in Doha, uh, that you work out of and you're currently in New Orleans. So talk a little bit more if you could please about like, yeah, how your life is today. I started teaching in New York, um, in the 1990s when I was getting my economics PhD and there I taught throughout the CUNY system. Well, I taught at about, uh, several campuses of the CUNY system. Mm -hmm. CUNY is the City University of New York, CUNY. Um, I taught at Staten Island College, at uh, Hunter College, even up at Lehman College of the Bronx, and outside of the CUNY system, I, I even ta I taught at New York University for a while as an adjunct lecturer, um, teaching a wide range of economics courses, including the history of political thought. Where do these ideas come from? Too many economists are getting their degrees without ever st studying what is, uh, uh, where do we get all these theories? They study these theories as if they just, just cut, like were revealed on stone tablets from God or something like that. They were developed by people for reasons, trying to solve problems. But anyway, um, so I taught, taught in the New York system. Then when I was studying at Oxford, I, I, taught, I taught some Oxford students a little bit there. Then uh, I get my first job as a, uh, my first full-time job as a political theorist was um, was at the University of Reading, which is about a half hour by train from Oxford, where I taught a wide range of wide range of students um, who were be because um, Reading is it's a it's a good university in the UK, but it's not Oxford, so it's not where the most privileged students are going. You get a lot of immigrant students, a lot of lower class uh, British students, um, and you get a wide range of backgrounds. And, and different perspectives from, from students like that. And then uh, I finally got a permanent job at Georgetown University's campus in Qatar, or locally they call it Qatar. I, I can't even really call Qatar, Qatar. I can't really say it the way they do in the local accent. And they have a high and low diction way of saying it. So they're pretty nice. Qataris are pretty nice about however you mangle the name of their country, it's it's okay. So Georgetown University, Qatar, or Qatar, or however you or Qatar, however you want to say it. Um, so there, I get um, students that are maybe a third from Qatar, a third from around the region, and a third from the rest of the world. And those tend to be they've changed a bit over the years. It depends. Um, uh, I get a lot a lot of students who are from elsewhere in the world, but they're there for a reason. They're there because. Their parents work there, or they're there because one of their parents is Muslim and they, they want to go to a Muslim country. But I do get students who are there just for the scholarship, and those tend to be from the Far East or Central America, at least lately. That's where they've tended to come from. So I get also a wide range there, but it's also it's, it's diverse in many ways, except for it's very prominently Muslim. Most of the students are Muslim, which I'm not used to. Most Americans are not used to most American teachers are not used to teaching classroom that's 80% Muslim. So I try to be really sensitive to what is the perspective of Muslim students. I'm not going to pull any punches about the fact that I I'm teaching them in a monarchy. And I think a monarchy is a terrible form of government and that the treatment of the lower class migrant laborers in Qatar is terrible. I don't pull any punches out that, but I do try to be sensitive to to uh, ethnic, cultural, and religious differences. Sure. I'm sure that's like influenced a lot of your your uh, uh, your writings and you know your beliefs, you know, seeing these different perspectives on how social contracts have been con you know have been in instituted around the world. Oh, yeah. Um, one thing I've noticed, e even in how we teach philosophy, uh, in we, the way we teach philosophy, they're usually between, uh, between St. Augustine, um, who was a, uh, uh, 
who was a, a both a religious figure and he was he, and a, a late Roman philosopher and and Saint Thomas Aquinas, who was another Christian religious figure. That's that's 800 years from the 400s to the 1200s. They usually there's this huge gap between there. And they get oh, and the beginnings of modern philosophy start with Saint Thomas Aquinas. Um, and uh, and and between that was the medieval period, which there's not much is going on. It got, well, uh, Muslims were doing some translation. Well, actually, Muslims weren't just doing translation; they were doing deep philosophy. Muslims and occasionally Christians and Jews who lived in Muslim countries, people like Maimonides, people like Al Farabi, people like Ibn Sina. So I teach, I teach about uh, Al Farabi, who was. Uh, uh, and teach about that, and teach about that, and I find that these people are, they're totally absent, and like there's this 800-year gap in this really comprehensive anthology that I have that goes from, that goes from, uh, from Plato until the 21st century, and they have this just enormous gap during this entire period where philosophers, where, where most people who were doing philosophy were Muslim, uh, so it's, de it's definitely changed my perspective on that, uh, uh, and I've I've all I've, I've I've already being somebody who's very much for religious freedom, freedom of freedom of belief and freedom of non-belief are are extremely important, and respect for people who believe differently from you is is extremely important. Yeah, what's well, touch yeah, oh, yeah, yeah I, touching on um something that uh, Sophic uh, mentioned earlier about your your service uh, to the world, um, I, I think a huge gift that you're giving to the world is that you are making the ethical uh, freedom-based argument for universal basic income. And, and it inspires me that you do this because my tendency has been to focus on the practical benefits to society. And, and that's great, uh, but as I was digging into your work, it dawned on me that I might be obscuring my truest feelings about UBI and that the ethical argument may actually be the stronger one. Uh, so could you start by giving us your your shortest argument for UBI and then guide us into a conversation about what you consider to be uh, some of the other essential ethical points? Shortest argument on UBI. You've probably, have as much as you've, you've researched my work, you've probably seen a video where I, I, I do this in tw like 27 seconds because uh, it's wrong to come between a person and the resources they need to survive. And that's exactly what we do. We pretend that poverty is a personal failing, that something just happens to other people. But what poverty is, is the lack of legal access to the resources you need to survive. And that happens for only one reason, because we make rules saying, these are the resources of the earth, this is the stuff we make out of them, and you don't own it. You've got to buy it from someone else. Well, who says they own it and you don't? Those are human-made rules. We have made rules that have disadvantaged people, that have caused that have caused people to be homeless and to be in economic destitution. And we we owe it to people. If we're going to create this private property-based economy, we got to make sure that everybody has some property. And that's why I'm for basic income. Hmm. Okay, that was the first part of your question, the shortest answer. Now, what was the second part of the question? Oh, if you could... Uh... Essentially, just talk about uh, some of the other ethical points that you feel um, I, either your favorite ones to talk about or, or what you feel are are essential. I, I have some others uh, that I've uh, that I like that I that I've heard from you, but I'm curious about yeah. how you uh, walk us into that. Well, I actually, um, uh, uh, I. I have I have various stump speeches on on basic income. It's, it's always a it's always a, a sort of a, a a riff on various on, on various themes um, that um, and uh, and I, I haven't actually I've only given it like once in the last year, so it's so uh, it, it's probably in in flux now. Um, but it comes from this from this this general observation that we create rules that disadvantage. People, um, it's not that um, people. It's not poverty is not a personal failing. It's a lack of legal access to the resources you need to survive. And there are societies known to anthropology where everybody has access to the resources they need to survive. Maybe they're maybe they are uh, 
maybe they are um, agrarian communities where, where everyone has access to land to farm, or maybe they are hunter-gatherer communities where people can fish, uh, they can hunt, they can gather, they can fish, they can, they can work as they like with the resources. And we want to say that everybody's better off in our society than these societies. You might be able to say the average person's better off, but you cannot say that everybody's better off. If you're living in a tent, if you're eating someone else's garbage, you probably would be better off if you had been born an Inuit, um, an Inuit hunting and gathering in northern Canada, or if you were born an Aceh, an Aceh hunting, hunting and gathering in uh, the jungles of Peru or the highlands of Peru, um, or in a bunch of other places. Um, so we have actually actively built a society that disadvantages the disadvantages the, this that makes the least advantage worse off than they could conceivably be if if there weren't all these rules creating society have and that doesn't just disadvantage the people at the very low end I was, I was only the people at the very low end who are worse off but the rest of us probably the 99 percent of us are therefore in a position where our default position if i don't do anything if you if you uh, leave your parents' home, you go through you go through mandatory public education. Leave your leave your parents' home. You don't get any more gifts from them. You don't get anything from anybody. You're and and you don't take a job, whatever job you can get. Your default position is to have nothing, and to be, and to then be homeless and begging or eating someone else's garbage. And we all know this. We all know that we must keep working to survive. We can, most of us can live off our savings for a very short amount of time. And we've got to keep working. That being in that position disadvantages everyone who works for a living relative to the people who own the capital and the land that we all need to work with in order to survive. It advantages owners and disadvantages workers. It privileges people who own stuff and disadvantages everyone who does stuff. And most of us do stuff for a living. Um, so what I talk about, what one of the things that I argue about a lot is that all of us need the power to say no. That's what I mean by independence. That's why I call it independentarianism, where I'm not going to actively contribute to the society. I'm not going to work for the society unless you make me a good offer. That reverses the incentive issue. We talk about, well, what's the incentive for people to work? I tell you what the incentive for people to work is. Good wages, good pay, advancement potential, and good benefits, good working conditions. That's the incentive for people to work. What is the incentive for employers to give good wages, good working conditions, and good advancement potential? When all of us know that if we don't take whatever job we can get, we will eventually become, we'll run out of our savings and we'll eventually become homeless. They don't have, they, the owners, do not have enough incentive to share the benefits of production with the people whose work contributes to that production. Um, so we need to create by by making sure that everyone has the power to say no because they have a basic income that they can live a decent life off. Uh, they, they have a good size basic income. By ensuring that everyone has this power to say no, we give enormous power to the 99% to create a much more equal society and one that will truly be in the advantage of everyone. I love it. If you, yeah, There's so many things we could branch off of, yeah. but here's what I uh, was gathering from that. I'd like to get uh, your thoughts on this, Carl, is um, uh, you said create incentives for these employers, these private enterprises, let's say, to enable something like this. So I guess, could you talk about like, what's the role of government in facilitating something like this? And what's the role of private enterprises to create these social contra uh, contracts, which are going to be mutually beneficial for all. Like I'm like me personally, I'm a believer in capitalism. Now we can talk about how it's devolved into what it is today and, you know, plundering resources and, you know, taking advantage of, uh, you know, different parts of the world and populations. But as 
as like a efficient, I mean, you're an economist, I don't want to you know, get into an argument with you, uh, but as a, you know, uh, as like the ethos of capitalism, you know, hey, you benefit, I benefit, and we keep doing what benefits us. Hopefully it doesn't encroach on other people's personal rights and all those things. But like, I guess, what's the role of private enterprises to create this world, which both Zach and I are, are intrigued by? Yeah. Well, to me, um, that is the amount of the economy that is that is that is run by a social democracy, and the amount of it that's run by private enterprise is an open question. Uh, what what um, what basic income does is create an economy where income doesn't have to start at zero. Income doesn't start at zero. The default position for you is not that you're going to be homeless if you don't do anything else. The starting point is not homelessness. Um, the default position comes you live off the basic income and you've got enough for food and shelter and clothing and transportation um, and a decent cushion on top of that. And you're getting some free services such as such as universal education and universal health care. Um, so you've got this base that you fall onto. Now that base could be with what is an otherwise a very market-oriented, very capitalist economy. Uh, or it could be what is very much a social democracy where, where the government runs a lot of the economy. And I think to me that issue is very much a technical question. What right. is good for What is good for society? Uh, but, but um, I want to argue is that if there are going to be, if there are going to be major inequality of ownership of the resources that are outside of the human body, you know, we, we all own ourselves. But, um, but the world was here without us, and. All property in the world, including electronic property and you know, some virtual property, of all electronic electronic property is made in part of, out of the natural resources of the earth that don't particularly belong to anybody. And to me, the way that you can say this person is going to be rich, this person is going to own lots of this stuff, is that they've got to do something for people who have less. And so... And so, so if you're going to justify a capitalist economy with with uh, with with some very rich people, they've got to they've got to bid on those resources. They've got to pay money for those resources specifically for redistribution to those who have less to say that then when this person owns when this person holds all this money, we're not going to invent some natural right where this guy gets to own stuff and this other guy doesn't. That's not natural rights. That's some natural concept of privilege, the privileged man and the unprivileged woman or something, whatever. Um, the, um, the, if you want to create a system and if you find it advantageous to create a system where this person has a bunch, then this person should be saying, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that I can make it in everybody's interest that I have this. So the amount that I will pay for the resources I'm using, this is going to be enough to compensate the to compensate the people who have less. And that this should be an, an ideal. This should be an agreement to so the person who say, okay, I've got to do with, I've got to live with a smaller share of resources than everybody else, because I'm that person at the bottom. Ideally, it would be a negotiation between the rich and the poor to find out what is the price that makes it so. Yes, I agree that this person has more because the amount they're paying me for the resources they have is worth my while. We can't really have that agreement, so we have to substitute that through legislation. So it's the role the government needs to have a really hard bargain where we say, no, we are not privatizing these oil fields um, unless we're sure that this is environmentally sustainable for future generations, and it might not be, um, and we might not privatize them at all, but also, but also that it is in the advantage of the people who aren't going to get this privileged access to these resources that is in their advantage to do it. So um, and and it's not just oil fields; it's the airways, it's the government-supported banking system. It is the it is that hugely expensive real estate in New York or London or San Francisco or anywhere else. Um, all of these things, all of these things, are what our resources are built out. 
And if people are paying their taxes, if people are paying their taxes and people at the bottom are getting the receipt of that stuff and building a decent life on that and saying, I contribute what I want to, I'm not forced to contribute to this this uh, market economy game that you've created, go ahead, create the market economy game. That, that I think, justifies, justifies the system we have, is that if you want to devote resources to the market economy, make it in every last person's mm. interest to do so. Mm. Love it. Are there examples, um, any cities, even countries, uh, that are, in your opinion, doing something similar to this or doing this well? Well, no, I think we're extremely far from it. Um, there are people, who are, there, are, there are countries that are closer than others, um, that uh, there, are, there are countries that are closer than others, um, but no, I wouldn't say any have, have, have done it terribly well. Um, the, the most famous examples you're gonna, you're gonna hear about are Alaska and Norway, um, where they actually charge money for international oil companies to come to their jurisdiction and drill there. And they actually give some of that money back to people. Right. Um, now, Alaska, I think, gives the money back in a better way because it gives it to every legal resident of Alaska. But Alaska has less oil relative to Norway and, um, and it had, does a better job of extracting the money from the oil companies. Over the period that I studied it, um, which was uh, which was the three decades leading up to about 2010, when when uh, when when we are 20, when the books came out in 2012, so our our data went up to about 2010. Uh, over the three decades leading up to that, Alaska had only gotten about 30 percent of the revenue from the from Alaskan oil. Norway got 70 percent, and they still found international oil companies to drill that oil up for them. And uh, no one is getting a much bigger cut. You got to drive a really hard bargain. You should not be conceding to companies any more than the top, any less than the top dollar they'll they'll pay. Everything else is a giveaway. If you think about, if you think about that, Alaska that we think of as this great, great, great place for extracting all this oil revenue, and giving it back to the people. Actually, most of it is a big giveaway. Like forty percent of the oil revenue is giveaway. To international oil companies, mm. assuming that Norway has the top dollar, and I'm not even sure that they do. But Norway, they do a very good job of redistributing that money through a citizen's pension. Um, but they do not have a, and they have a very generous support system that is conditional for younger people. Uh, I'd like to see them move to an unconditional support system for people. Mm. Um, but both of those countries use only do that for only one major product. Um, they're not doing it for real estate. They're not doing it for the broadcast spectrum. They're not doing it for the banking system. And those are really the biggest shared assets. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that governments need to focus on. And, and when you realize real estate is one, there's no such thing as a resource poor country. Singapore imports almost everything it consumes. What does Singapore have? Some of the world's most valuable real estate. Singapore is a resource rich country because real estate is a is a resource. Now, there are other countries, including the one I live in or I work in, I'm not there at the moment, Qatar, which lives entirely off of revenues that it gets from it almost entirely off of revenues that it gets from international companies that are using their natural resource. Um, Qatar uh, people think of it as, they, they think, oh, Middle East, they think oil. Well, actually, natural gas is the big one in Qatar. They have much more natural gas than, than Qatar, but they, 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 they do export both. And most, most countries in the region export both. Qatar happens to be heavy on natural gas. And they've been able to create a system where, that in some sense, it is on the, these type of principles that I'm talking about. They're driving a hard bargain with the international companies that want to use their resources, and they're making sure that every last Qatari citizen benefits financially from this. They do it in ways that I think cause problems, but I, I think it's fair to say that, that almost every Qatari has benefited very significantly from the oil revenue. And not every Mexican can say that. From Mexican 
Mexico's had oil a lot longer than than Qatar. And go to a a barrio outside of Tijuana and ask what benefit have you got from Mexico's oil industry. I get, I think you'd get a lot of blank stares. Uh, Oh, I think they built a pedestrian overpass over this highway or something with that oil money. So, mm. But in Qatar, every citizen benefits. But the downside is they've not created, they've not created a society any like it. They, they've not created a society free of poverty. They've decided we want poverty here, but we don't want any of our citizens to be, pop, to be poor. So what we're going to do is import poverty. Qatar has something like something mm. like 85 to 90 percent of the people who live in Qatar are not cutteries. They are guest workers. I'm one of the guest workers. Now, there are some guest workers like me where they say we want people with skills and we will pay up for these skills. We have this prestige project called Georgetown University in Qatar. We're going to pay up for university professors there. I get paid a lot more than I would if I if I worked in the United States. Mm. But for less skilled for, for 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 less skilled labor and skills they care le less about, what they're doing is they're scour scouring the earth for the cheapest labor they can find in any category, which tends to create what is like a caste, it's like, almost like a caste system, because you go to a construction site. And and it's like everybody's from like Sri Lanka or Nepal or or Bangladesh or someplace like someplace like that. You can tell by looking at the people like what kind of country they're. You go to uh, what kind of business they're in because if you know what a person from Sri Lanka looks like, you say okay, oh well, these are construction workers because they're they're from Sri Lanka. If you go, but if you go to a coffee shop, um, or a restaurant, or um or a supermarket or any service industry in Qatar, almost everybody who works there is going to be Filipino. And apparently what they found is um, Filipinos are the cheapest workers in the world who speak passable English. Uh, they must have really good English programs. That way. Now, they're um, and apparently they also, they have trouble with like a Nigerian accent. They don't want to hire Nigerians to be service workers because, uh, even though they probably speak better English than the Filipinos, but maybe I think they have trouble with the accent or something. I don't know why it is, but they prefer Filipinos for that. So the place has lots of lots of, Fil of Filipinos doing this, Nigerians doing that, Kenyans doing this, Sri Lankans doing that, and some people in living in horrible conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, what they've done, they instead of creating a country that has a lot less work going on, but... Uh, but a lot of privilege, they, uh, um, but all the workers getting paid well, which they could create. It is in their grasp to create an economy with a minimum salary, of something like $75,000 a year or something. They could create this. But instead of creating that, they create, they simply make it, well, we have so few citizens, they can all be the privileged, wealthy people. And then we'll just import all these poor people and There'll be no path to citizenship for the poor people, so they're constantly in fear of getting sending home. And we use this as a form of discipline to control the foreign workers in Qatar. Right. So there's 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 a lot of problems with Qatar. So they they've taken uh, like some of the tools that that I, uh, to make them work for their citizens to exactly kind of talk about, but they use these same tools to exploit foreigners when they could so afford not. And you know, as an American, I could say. America is not free from any of this. The United States treats some of its citizens way worse than Qatari treats its citizens. And we don't have as many guest workers. Um, but we do have guest workers that are in similar conditions to the Qatari workers in the United States. They're in smaller numbers, smaller percentage, but we have them. And then we have these unofficial guest workers, which we, we call illegal aliens, um, because we want to dismiss them, it was such a dismissive term, uh, illegal aliens or illegals for short. Just just by being here, they're they're illegal, and we blame these the most least privileged, most disadvantaged people in our society. We blame them for our problems. Oh, you're dragging, you're you're um, clogging up the welfare system and dragging down the wages of citizens. No, these are people here who are brought in by people who want 
a very compliant, very low wage labor force. That's why we have undocumented immigrants in the United States, because companies want someone who is very powerless that they can exploit. And this whole kick, kick the so-called illegals out people, they are playing right into the hands of the people who want a very compliant, they want this group of people to always be in the United States and always be afraid to be deported so they can have power over them. So uh, when I say Qatari has a lot of injustice, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean every we got everything right in my country. My country is bad in its own way. I I love the uh, directness and the honesty in your answers, Carl. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's and, and that's great. something you mentioned before that a lot of people in, in the basic income movement will say, "Oh, I think people will work just as much as as they would before," because they know that they know that there's this big powerful idea that that uh, uh, oh, there's these lazy people just won't work, um, and so uh, and so they they don't want to ch- they 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 want to convince people that they, that 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 uh, people will still work. Well, I say well. I wouldn't say refusing to take the jobs that are on offer in the United States right now with these very sub poverty wage jobs uh, where you've got a where you've got to get like three families and a house and five jobs, five jobs between two people or something in order to pay the rent uh, uh, that that we really should start with the assumption that low income people are working the right amount now or they should work more. I think low-income people in the United States are working too much, and that's the assumption that needs to be challenged, not play into this idea that, oh, people are going to get a basic income and they're still going to work as much as as they do now. If your idea is that, if your idea of justice is get poor people to work more, um, then basic income is never going to be the policy for you. Mm-hmm. We want to convince people of basic income. We got to say, we got to say, um, people need the power to say no to a bad job. And that there are bad jobs out there, and we got to face the reality that there's a lot of bad jobs out there. Completely agree. Right. Yep. Stop there. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, like on that note, like how from a from a free market perspective, how do we ensure that we still have people that do take, I don't know, janitor roles or, you know, roles that might be unfavorable, or like you know, low low skilled, you know, uh, jobs. Um, would that just kind of play itself out with, you know, uh, the employers needing to raise their, uh, raise their wages so that people do want to take those jobs? Is that? Yeah, that's what I think. If, if you got a job that is really difficult to do, um, that is unpleasant, um, you should pay people enough so people want that. Um, yeah. You know, I, um, I, my job is, I like my job way more, you know, even if the pay was, was the same. I like my job way more, more than the guy who teens, cleans the toilets at my office. Um, there, but there is some wage. Everyone has their price. Um, there is some wage, some working condition that will get me to leave the job I have and clean those toilets. Um, you wanna, you want that? If you, if you got work that really needs to be done, then you pay up for it. You pay. Uh, you pay enough to get a free person who doesn't have to do that job to do that job because they want to do that job. That's your responsibility as somebody who doesn't want to do that work themselves. And if you decide you can't afford, you can't afford to get somebody to do this work for you when they're free not to, then you've got two choices. Say, well, I'll do this work myself. Mm -hmm. Or I'll realize this work just doesn't really need to be done. There's a lot of bullshit jobs out there that don't really need to be done. We could get away uh, do we really need greeters at Walmart? If uh, if we didn't have such desperately poor people uh, who are willing to work for such low wages, would Walmart continue to have the greeter if they had to pay seventy five thousand dollars a year to get somebody to go and greet people? Hi, welcome to Walmart. Walmart. Would we really have them? Uh, maybe we would. Maybe they'd say, Yeah, it's really worthwhile. We like having a greeter. We will pay this great wage to a person. Or maybe they'll just say, Oh, actually, we we can do it out. We can get some uh, AI robots to do that, yeah. <laughs> uh, now, 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 that really, wow. Because well, what you just said is fantastically interesting because I, I completely disagree. 
Um, because mm. I uh, that because what what you show me by saying can we we can get an a, an AI robot to be a greeter at Walmart to me that is like the quintessential least skilled job in America the greeter at Walmart but yet I can see how that could be one job that can never be replaced by a robot no one wants to walk into a store and be greeted by a machine um, it doesn't it have the human touch either you won't have the greeter. I mean, I, I, if, um, mm -hmm. when I, when I pick up a phone and I hear some, hi, welcome, I hear a machine saying, hi, welcome, welcome to, uh, mutual life, uh, system. Your call is important to us. I, um, I am really annoyed that this machine has taken up my time. Nobody wants a machine greeter. Uh, so Walmart, what we think of this is really low skill job is actually one of the last ones that could conceivably be replaced by an AI. Now, a burger flipper, I don't care if a machine or a human creates, flips my burgers if I get a good burger. Uh, but somebody's going to greet me when I come into the door. Yeah, I want a human being. And I think they're going to, they're not going to build, I don't think they're going to build robots that are going to be saying, hi, welcome to, welcome to Walmart. I could yeah, be, but I, if yeah, they I mean, do. I think, I think you're right I, for Walmart, yeah. If they do, I think they'll be counterproductive. I think they, yeah. they, there might be some companies that will have a robot greeting people in the company. Um, but if they do good market research, they'll realize, wow, these are annoying more people than uh, than are feeling greeted by this machine. Yeah, yeah. I think I would rather have like a AI dog greeting me. Some people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I. I. Well, this this past summer, I took my dog to assisted living, to uh, to a nursing home, and to like a wake. Um, and the mm. dog's big hit in all those places. So I mm. hate it. Mm. Oh, oh yes. I I can see that. There was the dog. There's the dog right there. Yeah, I see that. Well, since you have a background as an economist, um, mm -hmm. I really want to ask you a few of the economic and policy questions about UBI that can be technically challenging to answer, uh, but which I've heard you answer excellently. Oh, um, thanks. So something that a lot of people do when thinking about the cost of UBI is to take the yearly amount of the UBI and multiply it by the population. This gets them the gross cost of the UBI, which is an enormous number that scares people and is often used as a way to dismiss the idea altogether. But of course, the gross cost does not not tell the whole story. Uh, so could you talk uh, about the gross cost versus the net cost for UBI? Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, so as you said, the gross cost is the size of the population times the basic income. You think about um, 300 million people in the United States, which is rounding down, uh, 300 people times $10,000, which is a really low UBI. You get this enormous number, uh, three, uh, uh, 300 times 10,000, what is, what, what is that, 30, 30, uh, let's say, wait. Uh, uh, I'm feeling my zeros. Okay, uh, three zeros that gets you to from millions to billions, thirty billion. So um, it's gonna be uh, what's it gonna be three trillion in, uh, a year or something, uh, or three hundred. Um, it gets you this enormous number, mm -hmm. enormous number, um, and it. But it's a phony number because we are not just introducing a UBI on its own without any taxes. Whenever you, whenever you, whenever the government spends money, that creates inflationary pressure. And it's gotta, and, and you can spend a little bit of money and sometimes, and in some cases, like during a recession, you can spend quite a bit of money with uh, creating this inflationary pressure without actually causing inflation. Um, but if you're gonna spend a lot of money, you're gonna have to counteract that by you're going to have to counteract the inflationary pressure that the money spending is by some policy that's going to take that, that's going to take that that's going to have contractionary pressure deflationary pressure to counteract that that inflationary pressure that's tax um i mean you could borrow money but borrowing money it's it's not the most effective way to discourage to to create deflationary pressure taxes are more effective um, especially, it also depends on how they're targeted. So you're going to introduce the basic income, and you're going to tax it, uh, and you're going to tax people. And the basic income is going to go equally to everybody, and the taxes are going to fall 
um, most they're going to they're fall heaviest on the people with the highest income and the highest wealth. So taxes are going to go up, income is going to go up, and the there are going to be people who are net recipients, meaning that they get more from their basic income than their taxes go up when we introduce the basic income. And there are other people who are going to be net contributors, meaning that their taxes go up more than the basic income, more than they get in the basic income. And what you really need to look at is the difference between how much you're paying in taxes and how much you're getting in basic income. Most people who get a basic income, they're not just living on the ba off the basic income only. They're also making some money and paying taxes on that money. And you got to you got to subtract that out to find that. So actually, um, they're paying a, a substantial amount. The, the net. The net beneficiaries of basic income are paying a substantial amount of their own basic income by paying it back in, in their income taxes or sales taxes or whatever taxes they're paying. The other people are paying, the net contributors are paying the whole of their own basic income. Now, you got to think about how much does it cost to give a dollar to yourself? It costs nothing. It costs something. For me to give a dollar to you costs me a dollar. For um, for me to give a dollar to myself costs nothing. Um, and, and so you've got to subtract out how much People are paying to themselves under basic income. And this is different than most other programs. Most people who are living off disability are not also making income and paying taxes. Um, so, they're the, so the net costs and the gross costs of disability are the same. Unemployment insurance, you're not at the same time collecting unemployment and making lots of money and, and paying taxes on it. But basic income goes to everybody. This becomes very important. And if you realize we're going to subtract out the amount that people pay to themselves, you find that depending on how the program is structured and how generous it is and what the tax rate is, maybe one third, maybe only one third of that gross cost, maybe only one sixth of that gross cost is actually a cost. You got to look at how much money are we really redistributing from those people at the top to the people at the bottom? What is the net redistributive effect? That is the real cost of basic income. And I've estimated that for the United States at 2.95% of GDP. Um, and right. I just have some coming out um, coming out cost estimates for the UK um, that are that are um, when you when you net out not only not only that effect, how much we're paying to ourselves, but what programs UBI can replace. Looking at that in the UK that already has a pretty Relative to the United States, it's got a fairly generous system. When you look both at how much people are paying to themselves and what existing programs the UBI will replace, you actually get a lower figure. Something, mm -hmm. okay, don't have the figures at my, my fingertips. I have to look it up. I think it's 2.4% of UK GDP would create uh, a UBI large enough to eliminate poverty. If depend, This, of course, is depending on which programs you're replacing and mm -hmm. what the tax rate is, but you could do it for 2.4% of GDP in in the UK, and you can do it for around 3% of GDP in the United States, according mm -hmm. to the English. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's amazing. And, and you've already talked um, a little, you've, you've already talked about inflation and, and some of your thinking around that. Um, could you uh, to get into a more specific area, could you talk about the effect you believe universal basic income will have on housing costs? Yeah, um, definitely it will it will increase housing costs in areas of concentrated poverty. But now people think, okay, everybody gets basic income. It's going to increase housing costs in the whole country. Well, no, it's not. Because you got to remember, most of these, oh, well, not most of these people, probably about, depending on the size of the, uh, you could have half or net contributors, maybe up to 70% could be, so, so half or net contributors, maybe only 30% are net contributors for a, for a very generous program. But you're still going to have at least 30% of the, of the, of the population is going to be a net contributor. They have less money to spend on housing. Housing costs where net contributors live are likely to go down. Um, and 
there's going to be a lot of people in the middle that they might be a net contributor, but they're only paying slightly more in taxes than other person who's a net beneficiary who is only receiving a little more in basic income. That's not going to be a huge effect on housing costs in that area. It will go up in the most poverty-stricken areas. But what that's going to do then is going to create, going to create more equality in housing and less concentrations of poverty. It will then be easier for people who, who formerly lived in these areas of concentrated poverty to live integrated with other people. We do have to take into account what are the what is the effect of housing price of UBI on housing prices and make sure that UBI is going to be enough that people can afford housing on it. Because uh, if we give a UBI and then in our in our ghettos, um, uh, the price of housing goes up and people don't uh, people don't benefit. That would be a that would be an enormous problem. So, but you're going to have greater housing equality. You're going to make sure it's enough that people can pay out. But also, we need other policies. The reason we have ghettos, and the reason that we have such expensive housing in our cities is because of government policies that are very favorable to landlords. We need policies that aren't so favorable to landlords. And some of them are actually not, it's not necessarily landlords they're favorable to. Some of them are zoning laws that aren't really good for landlords either. We got to have, we got to ease up on our zoning laws to allow people to buy, to build bigger, and more concentrated housing to make public transit more viable and also, and to relieve this pressure on housing. But we also, when we have less inequality, one of the drivers of housing prices is that the more inequality you have, the more money that rich people have that they don't know what to do with. And people are like, oh, that's great. They'll invest it in business and create jobs. Well, they don't always do that. Very often they buy real estate and all they do is push up real estate prices and make things more expensive for everybody else. So one thing we can do to counteract, we can have, we can change zoning laws, we can and but we can also tax the wealthy more and tax land more to take the speculative values out of land and to take to take the speculative um, premium that we're paying that's, that's causing this. So there's a lot we can do. There's a lot we can do to counteract any effect that UBI is going to have on pushing up the cost of housing. Mm -hmm. Amazing, and and thank you for uh, you answered several of my questions in in your answers you've given so okay, I, good i want to see Sothic. do you are there any other questions um that you have i think it might make sense to uh um uh, kind of uh let these sink in because i have so many questions there's so many like i said so many tangents we can go off of um which could be useful for our listeners um is there something that you would advise or recommend younger folks, let's say millennials or Gen Z, um, with like, how can they get educated or how can they get involved with some of the, with uh, actually implementing some of these ideas that you're talking about? Because we want to see some of the changes that you're talking about. So what's the best way to actually do that for the younger generations? That's where I, I, that's where I have to know the limits of my role. Um, okay. that um, people have a big, this is a problem that has been recognized since Socrates. Socrates recognizes problem. You get to be an expert in one area and people will treat you like you're an expert in every area. Um, and, and often the expert will begin to believe it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so a person, they're, they're an expert in this area and they think they know everything about every topic. And, and we get this all the time. Uh, we've interviewed no five Nobel Prize winners on uh, what to do about uh, what to about all these social problems. And these people have won the prize in, in, in physics and, and, and in, in chemistry and they're asking about social problems, you know. Um, and so they get people out of their expertise. I and when people hear I'm a basic I'm an, an expert on basic income. They think I'm an expert on all aspects of basic income. Um, and I've tried to be, I, I, I do economics I, and, and social justice issues. But when it comes to activism, I consider myself a follower, not a leader. When activists have a march, I'm out there. When an activist want me to speak at the march, I'm definitely up on stage speaking. But how to build that strategy 
has never been something that that I've, I've considered myself being really good at. This is where I have to follow the activists. Um, so now, but what I've noticed in the, in the, I've been involved in this movement since the 20th century. And what I've noticed in the last 10, 15 years, there's been enormous growth in activism. The activists used to just like write their treatises uh, just like the academics did because there weren't enough of them to really do activism, to get people out on the street and stuff like that. Now there are loads of activists. There are people who are people who are using their own money to make documentaries about basic income. There are people who are um, organizing like a basic income cafe or something like a basic income talk or basic income get together, a march, a uh, uh, demonstration project. These, these things are going on all over the world. Find out. Um, you can go to places like basicincome.org uh, which is which is uh, the Basic Income Earth Network's um, pro uh, website? Find out what find out what's going on in your area. What they'll know. but there's there's more localized ones. The one for the United St well, there are several for the United States, but usbig.net, which is the U.S. Basic Income Guarantee Network's um, website, they have information on what places like income movement. And uh, it's a foundation and, uh, and other U.S. activist groups are doing. Find out what activists are doing and either find out an activist group that's doing something that you like. Because some activist groups are going to do stuff that you think is a bad strategy. And others are going to do stuff you think is a great strategy. Either follow the ones, join the ones that you think have a good strategy. Or if you can't find one that you think is using the best strategy, start your own. Um, uh, but one of this great thing about the movement is there's all these people doing all these different things. Not all of them are going to work, but they're all contributing to this effort to try to find what does work. And there's a lot of people out there doing stuff. Um, and I really applaud everything everybody's doing. Even if your particular, stra your particular strategy, strategy fizzles, you're part of this movement that is building this thing. Amazing. Thank you for that answer, Carl. Thank you for that honest and... Uh heartfelt uh, answer. Appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks. Is there a place you would like people to go to follow your work? Yes. Uh, Whiterquist.com. Um, I, uh, um, every, uh, I try to, I try to focus everything I do. Uh, I try to make sure everything I write gets onto Whiterquist.com. Uh, so if you can spell my name, you can find my website. Spelling my name is challenging. But you can you can find most of my stuff, and I try to get uh, like early versions uh, of my work up there that that are I'm allowed to post, uh, legally allowed to post without it being behind the publisher's paywall. Uh, if you want, um, and so so I managed to get most of what I've done, at least some version of most of what I've done, is there, unless the publishers it, it, unless the publishers is saying I can't do it. Um, so. The uh, so that's a place to go. I also um, I have a YouTube channel. I actually uh, I actually have one for my personal stuff and one for my one for my uh, academic stuff. So you got to make sure you get the the you got to get you make sure you get the right academic channel, the right academic one to follow my academic stuff. But there's a lot of videos there, and I try to link not just to my videos but other videos that are on basic income or topics related to my work. Excellent. We'll look to look, link that in the uh, description for this YouTube uh, video. Okay. Appreciate your time, Thank Carl. You. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carl. Appreciate it. We'll be in touch for sure. Nice to meet you. And I, I appreciate what you guys are doing. This is, this is a great effort.